Hitchcock wanted images. He wanted pictures to do the talking. Hitchcock came in and invented another kind of film language, uh, one that was interior, using camera movement and editing in a different way. When they go out and shoot a movie, there are a lot of disparate shots all over the place. There's no form. The form is made in the editing room. The shower scene in Psycho, it's pure cinema. Pure cinema involves a visceral action sequences. Pure cinema is experiencing the world through what we see and what we hear and finding a way to put that into the dimensions of a film camera. Hitchcock was one of the great pioneers of cinema. Throughout his career, Hitchcock liked the phrase pure cinema. This is pure cinema. What he seems to have meant by that was that he wanted to use, as often as possible, strictly visual means, not dialogue, to get across the emotional impact, the feeling of a shot or a sequence. see and what we hear affects us and so much of the art of cinema and I think Hitchcock's art is finding a way to express that without describing it literally. Pure cinema for Hitchcock meant communicating through pictures. Give the audience something that only the movies can give you. You can get words from radio and books. You can get music from records and CDs and orchestras. You can get all those things somewhere else but only the movies can give you moving pictures. A chase sequence is pure cinema. You can't do a chase in a novel. You can't do it in a painting. You can't do it on a stage. That's pure cinema. It goes beyond storytelling. It goes into the creation of atmospheres and uh, moments that are unique to cinema. One of those moments can be Jimmy Stewart following Kim Novak through San Francisco with the camera and the music of Bernard Herrmann. It's impossible to imagine that that experience in radio or in theater or in painting. Filmmaking is made up of so many different components and so many different crafts that what made Hitchcock great and what I define pure cinema as is using all those tools available in making a film to get an emotional reaction. Hank! Oh, Hank! There's a theory that Hitchcock, deep in his heart, always remained a silent filmmaker. He started his career in the 1920s making silent films, and he was afraid that adding sound to the movies was gonna transform movies from being moving pictures into being photographs of people talking. One of the great uh, strengths of Hitchcock's movies is that you can turn off the sound and still understand the movie. I think that's really pure cinema, is when you don't need anything else but the visual, and you can understand not only what is happening dramatically, but you can feel what the characters are going through. This is why, for example, in a number of his films, we have long stretches of silence. Psycho has marvelous examples of Hitchcock as almost a silent filmmaker. When Marion walks out of Norman's office and then she goes in and she takes her shower, not a word is spoken. She takes the shower, she gets killed. There's this long scene where Norman is cleaning up after the murder, and then he throws the money into the trunk of the car and puts the body into the trunk of the car and drives down to the swamp and sinks the car in the swamp. It goes on and on and on. It's absolutely gripping. The only words you hear are just once. Mother, oh God, mother! Aside from that, it's minute after minute after minute after minute of pure silent storytelling with the brilliant Bernard Herrmann music underscoring the emotions. And there's almost no filmmaker around even now who would dare do such a thing. It's just too risky. I stole 
bloody mighty. Montage is nothing more than a string of shots put together in the editing room where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. If, for example, you were visiting a Hitchcock set and you saw him make one shot and then another shot and then another shot, it would not be terrifying because the making of each individual shot is a matter of framing it and perfecting the action, and then you shoot this shot, but the effect of the entire sequence as it's edited together is what gives you the effect, almost like music. The individual note by itself doesn't say much, but a combination of notes Bum, 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 bum. produces a very powerful effect. I think that is what Hitchcock meant by pure cinema, putting together these bits and pieces of film to create a feeling. Psycho has that extraordinary dialogue scene between Anthony Perkins and Martin Balsam. And I believe it's a medium two shot, sort of looking down the counter in a way, so they're in sort of profiles. It's so gentle as, as to the way he's, he's um, interrogating uh, Perkins. Do you mind looking at the picture before committing yourself? Commit myself? You sure talk like a policeman. <laughs> Look at the picture, please. And you could begin to see Perkins get just a little bit un undone. He goes, oh, something I forgot. And there's a quick cut. He hits the switch and it cuts the word Bates, bang, like that, a neon, and it cuts right back. That's the knife. That's the knife in the shower scene. You know that's the knife, you've already seen him do it, you know? So that cut becomes a weapon. And that stayed in my mind for years, and that's still, I still do it. I mean, um, it's all over Aviator, all of the films I make. I mean, at least the impulse, the impulse from that moment, I said, why am I compelled by this scene? You know that he's onto something because there's a very strange shot where Marty Balsam points out a name in the register, and Perkins has to lean over to see the name. And he, uh, Hitchcock doesn't cut to an over, uh, over the shoulder down. He doesn't cut to an angle looking up at Perkins. He lets Perkins move his head so you see the bottom of his chin for a long period of time. It's very awkward, and it has a real sense of unease about it and tension. That, for me, is just a pleasure watching those scenes. The, the Brevira scenes, they're still a pleasure to look at, particularly without sound, just to watch the rhythm of the cutting. It's all like ballet, it's all choreography, it's like dance. Frenzy is a good example of montage in the Hitchcock vein. Once he takes her away from the wall and lays her down in that beautiful shot over the chair backwards and she's upside down, that shot actually is an entree into the montage that follows. He goes into really powerful dynamic shots that become fragments, but the fragments are a montage element. <laughs> Montage in its original form was a quick succession of shots that forms an idea. Hitchcock doesn't really do that. The idea is already in place. There's gonna be a murder. He's not giving you so much a thought as an experience. Some of Hitchcock's greatest editing is in The Birds. Particularly, there's one sequence where the Tippi Hedren character uh, is in an attic, and all of a sudden the place is full of birds, and they are all attacking her, and the sense of being assailed by something that you can't even see properly is intensified for the audience by being seen in a montage of very quick shots. The kinds of editing styles that we find in, in, in Hitchcock's pictures are 
very Hitchcockian, which is to say they're unconventional. They're very much his type of style. He wasn't one to do the kinds of basic classical kind of covers that we're used to seeing, where we might start with a master shot, and then we might go into a medium close-up, and then the opposing medium close-up, and then the bigger close-up, and then the bigger close-up. That's kind of what he was talking about when he said that a lot of filmmakers really just photograph people talking. So he would juxtapose these things. He might have a wide shot and then go into an extreme close-up, or vice versa. In the birds is a classic example of a Hitchcockian shock effect cut that now a lot of people have used. I've probably used it myself a number of times. This worked very well in the theater with a, a packed audience, especially since Hitchcock took his time in the trip to the farm, in getting out of the truck, and in walking into the house, and in walking down the hall. Very, very deliberate, and then bam, bam, bam. Generally, you know, when you edit a film, you get the material. And even if the director is pretty meticulously prepared, you start riffing off that preparation. You might be following their original concept, or you might not be because you find a better way to do it. Since Hitchcock was so thoroughly prepared in storyboard, we have to assume that the cuts to a degree already existed in his head. That he knew that at this point, he was gonna go from this wide shot to this close up to this tighter shot. Yeah, essentially, a lot of the editing was preordained. I don't think there is a cut in Hitchcock that doesn't have an intention. Film can be punk music or film can be orchestral music. Hitchcock is an orchestra conductor. You know, if you want to be punk and you want to go three cameras, three different lenses, moving all the time, camera jittery, find it in the editing room, that's perfectly valid and great. But the Largos, the Allegros, the tempo, the harmony, that's precision. And Hitchcock is a precise filmmaker. Some of Hitchcock's greatest editing is cutting that film up into bits and pieces and putting it together in precisely the way you want it to be so that it will affect the audience in the strongest possible way. During the 1940s, he wasn't so sure about this. And he actually made a couple of films which tried to have no editing, no montage at all, or at least long stretches of the film where there was none. Open it. In 1948, uh, Hitchcock made a film called Rope. The story is based on the Leopold Loeb murders, and this picture is really about the suspense of whether people are going to discover that there's a body in the truck. I'll help you with that, Miss. Oh, thank you, Mr. Cadet. That's all right, Mrs. Wilson. He did not make a cut. He did not use montage at all. The montage was within the frame itself. Characters would move. The camera would pick up somebody over there. Somebody would move toward the camera at the end of a reel and black the camera out, which would permit them to change the roll of film without the audience noticing it. I do my best. I suppose you want to know if your concert will be a success. Yes, I do. You can say that this film didn't have any classical editing because there were no editing decisions to be made. They had all been pre-made. This was something no filmmaker would dare to do, and it seemed like the last thing for Hitchcock, who was a master of montage. And sure enough, he decided in the end it wasn't worth it, it didn't work. I'm afraid I let myself get carried away. And he went back to relying on editing, on montage, for a lot of his greatest effects. Take it easy now. All right, now here we go. Ah, where's the cinch? Here, I look up, I look down. I look up, I look down. Hitchcock said more than once that the subjective camera was more important than the acting and the actors. Namely, that when they looked and we saw what they saw, that that was important. Of course it is, because it makes us 
a participant. It puts us in the position of the actor doing the looking. When Hitch discussed with me this element, he used as an example rear window. He said it's a best example of the subjective use of the visual. A man looks, he sees, he responds. He looks, we see what he sees, and we feel what he feels. Hitchcock doesn't let you any closer than Jimmy Stewart gets. So when you're sitting there and you're watching it happen, it's framed almost like he's watching a movie. It becomes basically a movie within a movie. Early on, and it's just very harmless, it's just a guy looking out his back window, watching the day-to-day -day activities of his neighbors. It's that banality that Hitchcock exacerbates and turns and makes sinister and keeps it in that same frame. So you're kept exclusively in Jimmy Stewart's world. What normally would a filmmaker say, well, that's very limiting. I've got this whole set. I want to move around. I want to go into this apartment. I want to go in the composer. I want to shoot across the this and, and get it from a different vantage point. Hitchcock understood it by keeping that POV pure and only from his apartment. That's how all the suspense gets heightened. If Hitchcock had opted to go inside Thorwald's apartment, it would have destroyed what he had built to that point. I once had the great fortune to work with a, a production designer named Robert Boyle, who actually worked on The Birds and, and, and a number of other Hitchcock films. And I told him one of the things I always loved about Hitchcock were the way that he used point of view shots. And he said, yeah, Hitchcock was the only director that he ever worked with who actually would have them measure the height of the actor whose point of view it was so that the camera would be positioned absolutely correctly. The show's been running such a long time, I thought maybe attendance might be falling off. Look at the gas. That man's lighting a cigar. This sequence here, where the fire goes along the gasoline and, and creates another explosion, is subjective. And it's all through Melanie's eyes. Look at this. She's looking left, she looks almost center down, right, and right again. So that's counterpointed editing of her responses. They're very, she's not even in movement. They're, they're static emotional responses, but in juxtaposed to the images that we see, we associate that, that things are completely out of control. Now, we cut to a fully objective shot. It's like a God's life point of view. Nobody's point of view, we think. Now watch. One bird, two birds, three birds. Once they enter the shot, the shot becomes very different. And it gives me a sense of spectacle and incredible foreboding about what's going to happen there. Vertigo, James Stewart's character Scotty meets Judy, who looks exactly like Madeline. And the film prior to this time has always been in James Stewart Scotty's point of view. All right, I'll get my car. I'll be back for you in half an hour. Oh no, you you better give me time to change and get fixed up. An hour. Uh-huh. Suddenly, when Scotty leaves this scene, we don't follow him. We stay with Judy and we see in the memory montage what has transpired a short time before this. The point of view in the whole film has changed now. With this information, we, we achieve a whole new level of suspense. Is he gonna find out? Is she gonna kill him? Is she really a murderer? What's gonna happen between them? It allows for more tension and more suspense, and we can be rooting for her as well as James Stewart. And it's interesting because Alfred Hitchcock does that often in his films where he gets you to root for the so-called villain. Before you realize you're doing it, you're doing it, and you think about it later, say, oh my goodness. <laughs> Look at the point of view this way. It's not about whether it's a killer or a, a hero. It's about Hitchcock putting you in the mind of a character. Of that, you are that can be a killer, too. Horrible. Faded, fat, greedy women. 
They're alive. They're human beings. Are they? Hitchcock put the camera where it needed to be to make an emotional impact of a certain scene. He used close-ups very often at the opening of films. Very often it begins with a woman screaming. Think of Young and Innocent. Think of To Catch a Thief. Think of the scream that is the climax of The Man Who Knew Too Much. And of The Shower Murder in Psycho. But close-ups were used judiciously by Hitchcock when he knew that he had a really capable, well-prepared actress who could, with the glance of an eyelid and the flutter of an eyelash, give him what only the camera could capture, what could never transpire on a stage and reach the balcony, for example. Remember, say nothing. Hello. Hitchcock had regard for uh, the value and the power of a close-up and the value of a power of a wide shot. He knew exactly how to use them. Sometimes he can reel you into a situation quicker by entering through a close-up. And sometimes he just does it uh, masterfully uh, with a wider shot, like in Shadow of a Doubt, when Uncle Charlie is laying in the bed and you see the, the expressionistic shadows on top of him and the money thrown around him. That's a wide shot, but essentially it's a close-up of the situation of that character. For Hitchcock, it was a question of when should you have a close-up, when he needed a person's reaction. I can think of a moment in Marnie, when she's being interviewed by the office manager. Hitchcock cuts away from those two actors to Sean Connery's face. Why? So that we can see the moment, the flicker of recognition, when he finally realizes where he's seen or heard of this woman before. One of the things about Hitchcock, he, would, he had no reservations about putting you right in the middle of something. He wasn't tentative about it, he was forceful. And I think his use of really big close-ups, heavily weighted close-ups to left and right, or up, down, extraordinary angles, uh, he did fearlessly. Emotionally, between characters, Hitchcock would just go for close-ups, because that's where the emotion comes in. It comes in the eyes and the expressions of the actors. Go away. Go away. He usually took wide shots on location, especially in Vertigo. The man who knew too much, he showed you where they were. He showed you in Vertigo, they were underneath the bridge, and they were driving here, and it was a wide shot. But the emotional part was all done close-ups. I love you, Marilyn. I think that what we could say about Hitchcock as an innovator was that he took elements that had been used before, elements of storytelling, of the thriller, of the chase, of comedy, and was able to use it for his own purposes. Whether it's zooming in on something, whether it's blurry if the person might be crying, whether it's a very wide shot or a pull back to make us feel their sense of isolation. He uses the camera and the angles very well to get us into the character's head. I think in terms of combining real audience entertainment with real philosophical depth, there's never been a filmmaker greater than Hitchcock, and I'm not sure there's even been a filmmaker as great as Hitchcock. <laughs>